Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Schwartz Lecture on Dispute Resolution. My name is Rebecca Joseph. I am the Editor-in-Chief Elect of the Ohio State Journal on Dispute Resolution. Um, we're going to start off today by welcoming Chase Dean, who is our current Editor-in-Chief Elect, to begin today's event. Thank you so much. Hello. Welcome to today's Schwartz Lecture on Dispute Resolution. My name is Chase Dean, and I am the Editor-in-Chief at the Ohio State Journal on Dispute Resolution. The journal is delighted to host today's event in coordination with Mort's top ranked program on dispute resolution. Following today's lecture, the journal will work with Professor Josh Stolberg to publish remarks he delivers this afternoon in a forthcoming journal edition. To kick off today's lecture, I have the honor today of introducing Professor Sarah Cole, who in part serves as one of the two advisors for the Ohio State Journal on Dispute Resolution. Professor Cole is the Michael E. Moritz Chair in Alternative Dispute Resolution here at Moritz. Professor Cole received her BA in American History from the University of Puget Sound and her Juris Doctor from the University of Chicago Law School. Professor Cole is internationally recognized as a scholar in alternative dispute resolution, having been published in a plethora of law journals and co-authoring one of the leading dispute resolution case books in the country. It is with great honor I introduce you to Professor Cole. Thank you so much, Chase and Rebecca. And it's really a delight to be here today to introduce Josh Stolberg, my longtime colleague, uh, at, at the law school. Um, normally we ask the Dean to do the introduction and I was not sorry that he was busy today because I really wanted to do this introduction myself, uh, but didn't wanna take that honor away from the Dean if he was available. Uh, and the reason why is because I'm very much looking forward to celebrating Josh Stolberg and hearing from him uh, on, on mediation and the rule of law. Before we hear from Josh, I wanna take a moment to recognize Stanley Schwartz Jr a 1947 Moritz graduate who generously sponsors this lecture each year to promote scholarly publication in the area of dispute resolution. I'm certain that Professor Stolberg's remarks and scholarship will add to the Journal on Dispute Resolution's reputation and contribute to the legacy of this lecture. Indeed, because of events like these, including Stanley Schwartz's generosity and Professor Stolberg's participation, our program on dispute resolution is the number two dispute resolution program in the country, both last year and as we found out today, this year, uh, according to US News and World Report. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome my friend and colleague, Professor jo Joseph B. Stolberg to deliver the 2021 Schwartz Lecture on Dispute Resolution. Now the Emeritus Michael E. Moritz Chair in Alternative Dispute Resolution, Josh has dedicated his life's work to the field of dispute resolution. Active in the field for nearly 50 years, though that's hard to believe looking at him. <laughs> uh, act, uh, Josh began his dispute resolution career initiating a community mediation center in Rochester, New York as the vice president of AAA's community dispute services program. Regarded as one of the nation's preeminent mediation trainers and the only individual to participate in conducting mediator training for the U.S. Attorney General's original Dis Neighborhood Justice Center programs in Atlanta, Kansas City, and Los Angeles, Professor Stolberg has trained almost 10,000 people in 45 states to serve in court, agency-based, or community-based dispute resolution programs. And because we're on Zoom, we thought it might be nice to hear from our participants um, in, their, in terms of their connection to Josh Stolberg. So if you can see the raise hand function on your participant uh, toggle, please raise your hand if you, like me, have developed, implemented, or served a co-trainer as a co-trainer with Professor Stolberg. And keep that hand up uh, if you took a mediation training program that Josh taught. And further, keep your hand up or put your hand up if you took a mediation training program in the state of Florida, the state of Michigan, or the state of Ohio, where Josh's work has been integral to the development of training programs. And finally, put your hand up or keep your hand up if you've, if you've used work developed by Josh and his longtime collaborator, Leela Love, like the middle voice or two heads are better than one. Um, the middle voice, in my opinion, being one of the best resources for developing training programs of one's own if you're not lucky enough to be trained by Professor Stolberg. In addition to creating and implementing mediation training programs throughout the country, Josh also created the first peer mediation program in New York City public schools 
teamed with Partners for Democratic Change to deliver dispute resolution training to governmental and NGO leaders in Central and Eastern Europe. And together with Leela Love has taught courses on mediation theory and practice at multiple American law schools and for university students in Western, Central and Eastern Europe. He's been the recipient of numerous awards, including the American, American College of Civil Tri Trial Mediators Lifetime Achievement Award, the Ohio State University Faculty Award for Excellence in Community-Based Scholarship, and the ABA Section on Dispute Resolutions Award for Outstanding Scholarly Work. I know this is a long introduction, but I can't help myself because we know that Professor Stolberg's career in dispute resolution has uh, spanned years and over 60 articles in professional, professional journals on theoretical policy and practical issues in dispute resolution. Today's talk titled Mediation and the Rule of Law, Compatible or Conflicting, questions whether the use of mediation in state court systems is consistent with the mediation community's aspirational access to justice goals, or whether it is simply a docket clearing function. Professor Stolberg examines various fundamental norms of mediation and rule of law processes and assesses their compatibility or conflict, and then suggests how crucial yet exaggerated claims of dispute resolution proponents can be suitably strengthened to support the requirement of presumptive mediations used in our system of justice. Josh, we are very much looking forward to your lecture. Welcome. Sarah, that's wonderfully gracious. If I had any sense about me, Sarah, I would simply keep my mouth shut, uh, say the lecture is over, and invite questions. Uh, but but let me proceed. I'm, I'm deeply honored to have been invited to deliver this prestigious lecture. Reviewing the Schwartz speakers and their articles from years past, it is dawning to me for me to try to make a contribution that in the words of the famous philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, bears a family resemblance to their insights, but I shall try. First though, some personal comments. I have not had the privilege of meeting the family members of the late Mr. Schwartz, whose collective financial support has made this lecture possible. But I thank them deeply for the, their sustained support for what has become one of our country's most significant forum for the exchange of ideas regarding dispute resolution. Second, I want to recognize and thank all my former amazing colleagues from Moritz, faculty, administrators, staff, and students who have comprised this community that has been so central to my professional and personal life. My relationship with them over the years enriched the quality of my life in ways that I so cherish and not for the lack of their intelligence, they cannot possibly appreciate. Third, my thanks to JDR, its current and future editors, Chase Dean and Rebecca Joseph and the entire staff who so graciously host this event and finally, to all of you who have taken time to join us today, with a particular shout out to more students who might be in the audience. When I received this invitation pre-COVID, I was so excited that I'd have the opportunity to physically be in the law school building again and have the opportunity to meet with many of you, and in particular, to see and mingle with those students who are currently 3Ls, um, three else for when those persons launched their legal studies in fall 2018 they were my last moritz student class as a full-time moritz faculty member but the last covid prevents are physically being together but i picture each of you and other with warm feelings let me turn then to the subject of my remarks mediation and the rule of law Here's the context of my reflections. In 2019, New York State's Office of Court Administration implement, implemented a system-wide initiative for the presumptive use of ADR in all civil cases. What does that mean? As the state's chief judge, Janet DeFiore, described it in her most recent annual State of the Judiciary Address, quote, we remain 100% committed to implementing our model of presumptive early ADR in order to transform the old culture of quote, litigate first to the new culture of quote, mediate first in all appropriate cases. 
Dan White's a superb student and practitioner of ADR and OCA's director of the Division of Professional and Court Services and statewide coordinator of ADR programs, let alone being a wonderful friend, training partner and colleague to me and many of you in the audience as the daunting yet rewarding administrative task of executing that program's implementation. New York State is not the first state to adopt this approach. Florida launched the nation's first initiative of comparable breath in 1987, and other states in various forms have followed suit, including Ohio. But having New York State join this family, given its population, geographic size, and its significant role in the commercial and social light of our nation might constitute what Malcolm Gladwell has elsewhere called the tipping point. That is that New York's presumptive ADR mediation effort might in Gladwell's terminology, quote, spark a social epidemic spreading ideas, messages, behaviors, and products that ultimately reaches a tipping point and explodes. If this initiative constitutes a tipping point for our legal practices and traditions, I want to reflect on what aspects of its development might be desirable, what problematic, and most significantly, what normative values can structure and support it. I believe, and I think everyone in this audience agrees, that such a comprehensive program can be justified only if ADR process values can be convincingly reconciled with our constitutional aspirations and commitments to live in a political community that respects each person's dignity and respect. That is, those of us who style ourselves as ADR advocates cannot be, merely be rudder, rudderless cheerleaders for such a development. Rather, we must engage ourselves in the hard work of articulating and justifying how the presumptive use of these processes is consistent with and supportive of our fundamental, fundamental political and legal values of equality and liberty. In this lecture, I want to engage in and hopefully advance the analysis that might justify its use. Let me try to state my conclusions at the outset. They focus on two broad themes. First, the connection between presumptively private and public systems of dispute settlement must be seamless, consistent, and mutually reinforcing. They cannot operate at cross purposes with one another. To be reinforcing requires that they operate from a shared compatible system of governing values and norms. Quote, private and public justice systems are not mutually exclusive. Second, mediator neutrality is a positive posture of engagement that is necessary for two reasons. First, to justify the use of mediation in a small p political community whose fundamental values include recognizing and affirming each individual's right to be treated with equal dignity and respect. And second, to keep mediation and mediator conduct distinctive from the adjudicata adjudicatory processes. So let me try to elaborate. First, mediation and the rule of law. What do I envision when I use this magnificent phrase, the rule of law? I believe this concept is coherent only by presuming a version of the jurisprudential theory of law generally referenced as the school of legal positivism as developed in its most compelling explication by the late preeminent Oxford law professor, H.L.A. Hart. I believe a rule of law system would reflect at least the following features. First, legal principles and rules, including constitutional provisions, statutes, court decisions, and the like, are distinguishable from other types of norms, rules, and principles such as economic principles, religious rules, or ethical norms, and that legal rules trump non-legal rules when resolving a case. Second, legal rules in principle are published and known to, to whom all they apply. And third, the responsibility and integrity 
of a legal adjudicator is to apply the public law to a particular case with her assessment of what constitutes a relevant consideration guided by the applicable rule. This ensures that in a rule of law regime, considerations such as a party's wealth, race, gender, or political stature play no role when deciding a case. These obligations also explain why it is meaningful for a judge to say in the English language, that may be required by law, but it is economically inefficient. Or perhaps more significantly, that may be lawful, but it is immoral. There are obviously other features of a rule of law regime, but the ones I have noted are sufficient for my limited purposes. What do these features crystallize? I want to maintain in this presentation that there is an inseparable relationship between a rule of law regime and dispute resolution processes such as mediation and arbitration, particularly when endorsed and supported by a statewide court system. I believe that the nomenclature that ADR scholars, including myself, have often used to describe our court system as a quote, public system of justice, and then contrast it to mediation and arbitration by labeling, by labeling these latter processes as quote, private systems of justice, suggests an indefensible dichotomy. What observations do support this notion of mediation arbitration being private rather than public justice systems? ADR advocates quickly note features distinctive to a private system. The parties choose and compensate their neutral intervener. They create their procedural rules, including prohibiting attendance at the session by non-party participants, such as the news media. And they identify negotiating issues and embrace substantive outcomes that can differ from what is required by a dispositive legal rule. Such features do distinguish mediation from a public court process, but do they, they do not, I believe, warrant the inference that parties resolving disputes in a private system can do whatever they want. These alternative processes are valued and their outcomes effective because of their significant connection, significant connection to and support by the public system of justice. So we, we must explore whether and how these systems should, in Ronald Dworkin's wonderful phrase, properly and consistently support one another, quote, all the way down. I want to pursue this line of inquiry. The significant feature of a consensus building dispute resolution process is that contesting parties can choose any norm or rule as the, as the decisive standard to govern the resolution of their dispute. It can be a religious standard, company policy, ethical principle, or legal norm. Crucially, the legal norm holds no special pride of place, nor trumps all others in resolving the matter. And it is not simply that a party might agree to, quote, waive its legal claims. Far more affirmatively, parties use the consensus building process to, de to develop what they call collectively embrace as a better, more desirable outcome than would be the case if the matter were adjudicated. Some ADR advocates, I believe, tout this feature to, the, to suggest that the parties are, quote, free to be you and me. While those sentiments are compelling, I believe they overstate the case. That is, I do not believe that party autonomy in a consensus building effort warrants the conclusion that party conduct and agreement can trump the values of equality, dignity, and safety that ground our legal system. Let me try to illustrate the point I'm, try I'm trying to make. Uh, suppose a tenant and landlord agree to resolve a rent dispute via arbitration. The tenant claims that the landlord unlawfully refused to refund to her the $3,000 security deposit she had paid at the beginning of the lease and she demands treble damages pursuant to the jurisdiction's statutory provision governing improper withholding of security deposit. The landlord claims she used the entire deposit to cover damages to the apartment caused by the tenant. The parties and counsel present their case to the arbitrator. She pub 
and the arbitrator publicly embraces the tenant's account of the facts, but awards her only $3,000, believing that amount is appropriate. If the tenant were to file a motion in court to set aside the arbitrator's decision, claiming the court erred in not awarding her treble damages, the court's message to the tenant in broad terms would state, you chose the forum in which you wanted to resolve this dispute, live with the consequences. While this example might suggest that there might be a sharp division between private and public dispute resolution processes and their governing norms, consider the following. An airline pilot for a commercial airline, Delta, consumed significant amounts of alcohol the night before a scheduled 7 a.m. flight for which he was the piloted command. The next morning, despite strong concerns expressed by the flight attendants to the cockpit flight crew as passengers boarded that the pilot in command was drunk and should be replaced, the pilot directed the one hour flight. Once the plane landed, the flight attendants reported their concern to the commanding captain who required all airline personnel to immediately take alcoholic tests. The pilot's blood count even hours after completing the flight, notably exceeded lawful limits. The company Delta fired the pilot. The union filed a grievance and the review board overturned the discharge. Delta filed claims in federal court to set aside the board's decision. The federal district court later affirmed by an en, en banc appeals court affirmed the discharge noting that the board's decision to overturn the termination would violate public policy. The, features that parties mutually, the, the feature that parties mutually agreed to a process and accepted its outcomes will not and should not be supported if those outcomes privilege behavior by some that displays disrespect for and endangers the safety of the integrity and well-being of fellow human beings. So the interplay between public and private should be active and current and not viewed as one of each, as, as one consistency, one constituency limiting or constraining the operation of the other. Let me try to expand that claim. I believe that it is crucial as a matter of public policy that we engage in discussion that examines the appropriate scope and depth, if any, of rules governing, for example, the extent of confidentiality privileges of the mediation process when it is used to assist parties to resolve matters such as Me Too litigation, as the one involving the claims uh, by, against Larry Nasser in Michigan State University, or the cases involving the claims of sexual abuse of young male parishioners by clergy. I think that review is warranted and urgent. This is not a war among competing factions, uh, government versus private sector. It is a shared attempt to analyze and structures how to ensure the fair treatment of equal citizens. What is the general lesson I'm trying to tease out? To me, the decisive lesson of such examples is that ADR and public court processes operate appropriately in tandem only when tethered to fundamental norms that guide our collective conduct as citizens in a political community. I very much want and believe that the New York State's presumptive mediation initiatives and others like it can work and is a valuable element of a free society, but not if it is not joined at the hip with our basic values. This of course is only the beginning of the story. If the basic norms and values of these two justice forum are mutually reinforcing and consistent, I believe that mediation can operate appropriately only if its conception requires a mediator to embrace an affirmative posture of neutrality. What does that mean? I believe it is important to distinguish the mediation process and the role of the mediator from its more extended application to mediation-like processes in which an intervener deploys mediating skills to facilitate understanding and agreement. What is involved? When we envision using the mediation process, or at least when I envision it, as an alternative to a court proceeding, what is my picture of that procedure? 
What are the mediators, parties, and their representatives trying to do that distinguish it from a civil court proceeding? Here is one account. Mediation is a process in which a neutral intervener is invited by or accepted by disputing parties to assist them to identify matters of concern, negotiable issues, and then discuss, analyze, and propose solutions to those matters with the goal that the solutions are acceptable to each of the disputing parties. In this context, mediator neutrality is a, po a positive affirmative posture of engagement. What do I mean by that? Two general features. First, I believe that neutrality differs importantly from impartiality. And second, mediator neutrality as it relates to supporting the party's substantive outcomes is more deeply grounded than it's simply meeting supporting party resolution preferences over one's own, uh, the mediator's uh, own preferences. Let me try to explain this. First, mediator impartiality. I believe that a mediator acting impartially requires that she act in ways that ensure the, pra that pr the practices and features that govern participant interaction are applied equally to each participant unless an exception can be generalized in a morally relevant way. For instance, if the agreed upon ground rule is that each party is permitted a maximum of 30 minutes to make its opening presentation, then a mediator acting impartially must take appropriate steps to bring each party's presentation to a close if it were about to exceed that time guideline. The mediator who allows the smarter person or the more articulate person to speak longer has not embraced an exception that is morally justifiable. If the ground rule is that each party is invited to make her presentation without interruption by the other participants, then a mediator must impartially secure compliance by cutting off the interrupting comments among the participants. If a mediator indicates that she will caucus with individual parties if she thought that would be helpful, she would violate her impartiality if she caucused exclusively with one party to the dispute. But neutrality, not impartiality, I believe is the crucial norm governing mediator conduct. Neutrality, as I understand it, does not mean that a mediator is indifferent to or should support any party preferences that are mutually embraced. Let me elaborate. Presume a divorcing husband propose a, proposes a parenting arrangement in which he has exclusive authority to make all decisions regarding the religious training, day schooling arrangement, and after school activities of the couple's two children, ages 10 and eight. In exchange, the children could, would reside full-time with their mother with the father's parenting time limited to a two-week period each summer. The wife immediately accepts the proposal, commenting, quote, you, the husband, are so much more knowledgeable and insightful about these matters than I am. This is a fine arrangement. I believe that a mediator who quite properly supports that party developed outcome, that this party developed outcome, presuming she has reality tested its implementation, is not acting impartially or partially by supporting it, but is rather affirmatively adopting a neutral posture regarding those settlement terms that is predicated on the mediator's deeper commitment to the following normative principle a genuine respect for the integrity of an individual to fashion his or her lifestyle in a manner congruent with their vision of an effective, rewarding human existence. That is, a mediator must be normatively, inescapably committed to the democratic principle that each person within the political community has a, a right to decide for herself what constitutes the, the preferred or best answer to the question of how best to fashion a good life. In that sense, being neutral among a person's choices. So even if the proposed settlement terms in the marriage disillusion example differ, imp differ importantly from outcomes and values that the mediator herself 
believes might be better designed to realize one's human dignity, the mediator, I believe, quite properly remains quiet. The mediator, for instance, might be thinking to herself, ma'am, come on, you're an intelligent, caring person. Uh, why are you letting your husband assume such significant control over your children's lives? Have more pride in your abilities and offer some type of proposal uh, that meets your needs. But the mediator's commitment to treat each person with dignity and respect uh, um, regarding acceptable outcomes is grounded in her deeper normative commitment to treat that each person with dignity and respect. In Rawlsian terms, a mediator is committed to honoring, respecting, and supporting each individual's development of the primary goods of liberty, self-respect, and a sure confidence in a sense of one's own worth that she is entitled to fashion for herself. To state this differently, I believe that this neutrality commitment operates at two levels. The first, a mediator supporting, not blocking particular settlement terms that the parties develop and embrace is akin to the Fisher-Urey notion that parties can develop multiple ways, positions, to resolve their dispute that might be acceptable. And that that is possible because these various positions in some fashion promote or secure rather than undermine their interests. At a second level, at least for the mediator, she can remain neutral with regard to the particular settlement terms if she is confident that they are being embraced by someone who is genuinely fashioning her life, lived experience in a matter she deems meaningful and doable for her. Perhaps this neutrality commitment grounded in a normative commitment that I'm trying to explicate is easy to picture, easier to picture for situations in which a mediator assists disputing parties resolve a contested breach of employment contract case. The plaintiff demands 400,000 in damages, the defendant counter offers at 25,000. Several hours later, the parties appear ready to embrace a resolution at $100,000. A mediator who might have strong beliefs that the plaintiff's claim was minimally worth $250,000 that the plaintiff has a strong chance to prevail at trial at 350,000 and therefore undertakes to prevent the parties from culminating their acceptance of the $100,000 deal would, I think, be roundly criticized by the professional mediator community for not acting properly. Not for being partial rather than impartial, but rather for not being neutral reg regarding particular outcomes but also for not affirmatively embracing that deeper normative uh, value of according respect and support for parties fashioning their vision of a good life. What am I trying to say perhaps, uh, what I'm trying to say perhaps not very clearly is that a mediator supporting party choice in this way is acting on a principle much more robust than the mediator who states at least to herself, it's important for, me, to, for a mediator, me as mediator to be humble in terms of knowing what I don't know as well as what I know. Since I don't really know the plaintiff's life situation might be or the defendant's, I should keep my viewpoints about employment or parenting situations uh, to myself and let the parties decide for themselves what might work best for them. That humility is admirable, but I don't believe it's adequate for grounding a mediator's responsibility. I wish to urge that a mediator who is neutral with regard to respecting how an individual acts, individual sets priorities among her life's primary goods, is embracing a strongly affirmative normative posture to honor each person's liberty to shape their meaning of a workable life plan. But as I've noted previously, I believe there are boundaries. A mediator properly challenges parties who might agree to terms that are unconscionable or deeply violative, violative of respecting one another's dignity, such as an employment relationship that borders on servitude. So I disagree with those mediator supporters 
who quite popularly admonish each mediator to quote, leave her values at the door. A mediator must have an exhibit values. I don't think there's any way out of doing that. But I recognize that very thoughtful scholars and practitioners have urged that neutrality is not a required feature of a mediator's engagement posture. So I want to turn in this concluding segment to examine such viewpoints and to examine uh, and to explain why I do not find them persuasive. I believe there might be three types of reasons marshaled to support the view that a neutral posture of judgment is not a required element for being a mediator. The first view noted previously and popularly expressed in the phrase that a mediator ought to leave her values at the door is if coherent, making a claim about the nature of ethical values that suggests some version of ethical relativism. It appeals to a theoretical claim that it is not possible for there to be objective considerations that warrant the adoption of some values and the rejection of others. All ethical values this, point, point, this viewpoint maintains are relative. You may believe that it is right, your duty, for you to do what you have promised to do and should be criticized for failing to keep your promise. But that is true on this viewpoint only for you, not necessarily others. Or you may believe it is wrong to inflict physical pain on innocent children. But that is only your belief, your quote, bias, to use contemporary jargon. You cannot establish for me, prove to me, that it is morally wrong for me to engage in such conduct. To me, such claims in support of ethical relativism have been persuasively refuted by many others, and I won't explore that further. The two other views I want to consider are these. First, some scholars reflected significantly by the perceptive work of my dear friend, Professor Boruch Bush, if I understand them correctly, claim that party autonomy, self-determination, is the most important value of the mediation process. That is, self-determination takes priority over all others within the process. I believe this claim is unpersuasive. Why? As I view it, conducting a mediation session is a justice event. The notion that party autonomy Trump's principles supporting a fair process minimally ignores a crucial real world factor. Different persons have different resources, financially, linguistically, socially, and the persons with such power can leverage it to significantly advantage themselves at the expense of their counterpart. So while I strongly believe that the right of a person to participate in the decision-making process is a necessary dimension of, of a person having a justice experience, that feature by itself cannot be sufficient. There must be, I believe, an important requirement that persons operate from and within a framework of human equality. It is obvious that power disparities among individuals or groups are part of the real world in which we live. I do not believe though that that feature by itself makes it impossible for mediation to be conducted fairly. I believe it possible and necessary to identify embraced parameters within which mediation, within which mediation operates that constrain, parties that, that, that constrain parties from accepting arrangements that violate equality. And that a person acting as a mediator can appropriately respect those boundaries while consistently refraining from adopting an adjudicatory law enforcement or evaluative type posture, that is a non-neutral posture. So for me, establishing a mediation program to address homeowner foreclosure actions, repayment of student loan debt, or New York's presumptive mediation program requires highlighting and emphasizing the important connection between a mediator acting neutrally with legal and community norms that structure the fair procedures and outcomes. 
a final consideration. The Uniform Mediation Act, brilliantly developed by a group of legal scholars, practitioners, and judges, and led by Moritz's own amazing dean and a professor emeritus, Nancy Rogers, my esteemed colleague and cherished friend, invites a different conception, perspective regarding the conception of a mediator. The UMA defines mediation as a process in which a mediator facilitates communication and negotiation between parties to assist them in reaching a voluntary agreement regarding the dis dispute, and then defines a mediator as an individual who conducts a mediation. Another UMA provision requires a mediator to disclose possible conflicts of interest and to be impartial, but a neutral posture engagement, as I have been suggesting, is not required. This picture of mediation, I believe, highlights an important feature of our daily lives. And that is that each of us in multiple settings and inescapably deploy mediating skills to help persons advance problem solving. Such situations are not framed as mediating a legal cause of action, but are rather described as and uh, described as addressing and resolving business challenges, organizational conflicts, or citizen or personal interactions by someone who skillfully uses mediating skills. A parent's teenage child is disciplined by a high school teacher and suspended from school for three days. Her parents asked to meet with the principal and the teacher to quote, talk things through. The principal in conducting that meeting deploys problem solving skills emblematic of a mediator. She welcomes the participants, arranges the seating so as to ensure equity, elicits information, frames topics neutrally, sequences discussion, and explores options that all might find acceptable. We can multiply these examples a thousandfold. The president of the Board of Deacons of a church attempts to secure consensus on how to address a publicly embarrassing incident of its lead pastor. A university provost convenes meetings of deans in an attempt to forge consensus on how to manage operations during the COVID pandemic. A law school acting as dean, a law school dean as mediator meets with a law professor and her student to assist them to resolve a grade dispute. Or perhaps less comfortably, but I believe accurately, a citizen of one country admirably facilitates the negotiation between interested groups to secure the purchase and sale, the purchase, sale, and delivery of a significant cache of addictive drugs, or even worse, a group of young women for sale across international borders. What's the takeaway? I believe that each of these exam the examples just noted are compatible with the UMA definition of a mediator and the mediation process. They reflect an individual who facilitates communication and negotiation between parties to assist them in reaching a voluntary agreement regarding their dispute. Why do I not believe that this vision of mediation is persuasive? I think this UMA account enables us to endorse as an example of mediation the intervention of the law school dean as mediator who assists the professor and student to resolve a grade complaint as long as their negotiated outcome is consistent with college policies. But if this reflects appropriate mediating conduct and value, then I believe it licenses any mediator in any context to deploy all in the name of promoting settlement, a dizzying array of tactics and strategies to resolve cases however manipulative they might be, and irrespective of whether parties in council experience the mediator's conduct as misleading, condescending, or coercive. To state my concern differently, the UMA definition to me appears to support a mediator who, in the words of the wonderful title of an article by my dear friend and colleague, Jim Alfini, uh, encourage uh, a mediator engage it encourages a mediator to engage in trashing, bashing, or hashing parties into a settlement. To me, this view of mediation constitutes an extended sense of mediation. It is not wrong, but it is not, from my perspective, 
its core. Let me conclude in this vein. I believe that if New York State's presumptive mediation initiative constitutes a tipping point, it could hold the promise of electrifying justice engagements among our citizens. In its broadest terms, it could be a vehicle for significantly advancing and securing a more inclusive, resilient, and decent society. But it needs to be shaped, supported, and executed, grounded in our shared disciplined commitment to honoring the right of each citizen to be treated with dignity and respect. Perhaps this is too autobiographical, but I became involved in an, and excited in this work because I believe that the mediation process at, as taught and passed on to me by my esteemed mentors and professionals constituted a valuable social vehicle for promoting justice experiences, justice experiences and outcomes for our citizens. Whether using mediation to assist parties resolve a litigated case, address contentious relations among an employer and its employees' representatives, such as that now being now occurring between Amazon and its workforce, or bringing vocal protest citizen protesters together with local community, government, and law enforcement leaders to address civic disruptions stemming from matters relating to police practices, public health, or to public, delivering public health services, that engaging and executing the mediation process well required unapologetically that a mediator be neutral in the ways I have tried to identify, but that a neutral engagement posture was not synonymous with a mediator being neutered. For me, it is not ex at all accidental that the vision of mediation that these women and men shared with me reinforces and is consistent with the deeper normative values that, that sustain our living in a free democratic society. And for those reasons, it has made for me the practice and study of mediation such a rewarding way to have lived my life uh, and my colleagues who've enjoyed the same uh, opportunities to have enriched theirs. I hope that, uh, that those of you who are pursuing comparable life paths enjoy the same types of rewards. Thank you very much for your patience in, my, in listening to my remarks. All right, thank you so much, Professor Stolberg, for such wonderful remarks. Uh, we're so delighted to have the next 15 minutes reserved for Q&A, and we've pulled a couple of questions from the chat already. Uh, participants, you should feel free to send a message, continue to send messages in the Q&A or the chat, or to raise your hand. Uh, the first question comes from Grand Lum, who writes, thank you so much for your continued thoughtfulness on mediator neutrality and impartiality. What is your perspective on multi-partiality? For example, rather than forcing objectivity, perhaps giving equitable attention to multiple identities and experiences. Well, that's a wonderful question. As I understand, understand it, it is based in the acknowledgement that we all have our limitations. Uh, well, if I understand it correctly, let me put it this way. Uh, Grant's question um, identifies that we all have limitations so that if I want to intervene in a dispute involving the defacing of uh, a house of religious worship and I'm interacting with multiple uh, members of the community uh, to presume that I um, can operate both impartially and, and neutrally with all of those persons might be a sign of hubris. Uh, and that as a practical matter, the most effective way to uh, engage in the service is to develop a team of mediators who might reflect multiple lived experiences uh, and, and abilities. I believe at a practical level for controversies like that, that is 
the, the, the most wise way to proceed. Uh, if I understand Grant's question, that, that would be my response. Ho hopefully that's responsive. Thank you. Our second question today comes from Mary Cotter, who asks, in your seminal work and in your seminal and superb work, excuse me, taking charge and managing conflict in 1987, you stated that mediators must be trained, but demands for licensing were premature. Do you still agree? And what thoughts do you have on training for mediators working in state courts with presumptive mediation? That's a great question. Um, you know, my, the history is Sarah wonder of, of my experience in this area as Sarah generously uh, referenced started in directing a community-based mediation program in Rochester, New York and the mediators uh, serving there were volunteers from the community. They could be law trained educators, uh, stay at home parents. And the notion of training was central to offering and ensuring a, a quality program so that uh, judges and others who um, opted for the process would, would in, in, have an experience that was competently performed. Um, I, I believe training is crucial. Um, and at least in my experience, the, um, the, 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 the professed claim that I don't need to be trained as a media, uh, in mediation because I've already been trained in that comes from two primary groups. One, lawyers who've been involved, who have been trained and been involved in settlement discussions and various kinds of third party processes. And at least in my experience, there are a number of persons in the uh, mental health profession who believe that their training as a psychologist uh, or social worker have given them the entire skill set they need to mediate uh, in, in effective ways. Um, I'm not persuaded by that. I believe there's a, as I've tried to articulate, a vision of this process as a justice process. It differs from a trial importantly, and lawyers need to appreciate and understand the intervener's role. It differs from getting people together and, you know, hopefully it will help advance uh, each person's mental health uh, and safety. But uh, there's more to uh, resolving uh, matters than just focusing on feelings. So I remain a strong proponent of jurisdictions that require training. I go even uh, of persons who the court would identify as appropriate mediators. And, and hopefully by requiring that training, um, it would discourage people uh, who hadn't gone through the training from hanging out a shingle saying, I'm a mediator because there's no licensing requirement. I'm still averse to um, having the equivalent of a licensing test uh, to mediate. Uh, I must admit that was raised as a possibility years ago in Florida when I first uh, conducted the trainings there. I actually developed a test to see uh, for people to pass at the end of a training program and the court after complaints from various persons, mostly retired judges who hadn't passed the court, passed the test, uh, graciously decided not to, not to have a test. But that was a version of licensing. I know there's movement to do that, uh, particularly involving complex uh, business transaction, particularly in the international environment. I'm just not, or to certify mediators. I think if the training is rigorous, if you get a chance to take a training program with a Professor Folick or Professor Cole or Rogers or a number of people throughout the country uh, who are talented, you know, to me that's, that's enough. Uh, but I, I do think courts should require that before they impanel any participant to be listed on their panel as a resource parties can turn to. Thank you, Professor. Our next question comes from Harold Paddock who writes, do court annex mediation programs give the parties a best of both worlds approach that hits the ideal place between anything goes private arbitration or mediation and the formal process of trial? Well, um, it's, it's great to 
to welcome that question from a dear friend. Um, I haven't thought of it in those terms. It surely establishes an environment where people uh, justifiably or not attribute um, participating in something that takes place in a courthouse uh, that I continue to believe remains a revered institution in our civil society. I'm sorry about that. Um, and if 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 it were core, if it if the mediation were being conducted either physically there or under the auspices of the court, I think it reinforces to me strongly that if 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 done well, it's going to be a justice event in the ways I've described. I do think that whether it's the best of both worlds, it um, it signals more visibly and publicly to the participant that it's a conversation that should be consistent with justice norms rather than parties cutting a deal, just, just to move on. So I think uh, in that sense, I, I view it um, in a very positive way. To me, the drawback of mediating connected to a court is not that it's happening, it's just there's so many other kinds of context in which mediation is useful and I believe ought to be conducted as a justice event from current social controversies uh, erupting in our communities that we re read about daily to programs designed to help students in high school or middle school resolve disputes. I believe those feature those programs ought to be justice norm based um, and to the extent that people view mediation in justice terms only as connected to the court to me is is regrettable so long-winded answer to a thoughtful question thank you at this time i'm going to turn to professor cole for our next question go ahead professor cole Hi, Josh, thank you so much for your lecture. And I, I wanted to ask one of my favorite phrases, I guess maybe it's your catchphrase uh, that I like to use when I'm teaching mediation is that mediation is a settlement event, um, which I've always taken to mean people prepare for it. It's an event in the life of a litigation where there's an opportunity for settlement and you know people might be more inclined to do it because it's a more formal setting for, for resolution. And today you referred to mediation as a justice event. So I'm wondering if I need to modify and describe mediation as a settlement event and later as a justice event. Are those two things consistent? Are those two phrases consistent or is your thinking evolved on that issue? I believe they're consistent. Uh, I think it's possible that if persons focus as the most important value of the mediation to get a settlement, then it can warrant mediator conduct that verges on coercion uh, or in other ways uh, supporting information sharing or lack thereof that uh, might not comport with um, what we might think of as a fair procedure. But I surely believe that, as, as I tried to suggest in how I portrayed mediation. It's designed to advance a settlement. A, a good friend of mine and one of the country's preeminent mediators, Larry Watson uh, in Florida, portrays mediation as his job as a mediator is to put parties in a position to make the decision, does it make sense to settle now? Um, but to me, that that is central to mediation, to conduct a mediation uh, for purposes of um, exchanging dialogue uh, to, to share concerns um, is valuable, but um, it's to me, that's a different process. So for example, I don't think those wonderfully talented people who conduct public conversations are mediating at all. The goal there is not to forge, help parties forge a resolution, a settlement, it's to 
share perspectives and enrich understanding a lot of goals. So I'm not sure you have to change your terminology, but infuse settlement, uh, the vision of settlement with, uh, you know, norms of fair play, due process, things of that nature. Thank you, Professor. Our next question comes from uh, two new mediators, Jeff Kent and Tyler, who are both here at Ohio State. Um, they're both new mediators. They are both interested in mediation. Jess observes that it's challenging to secure mediation opportunities. And Tyler asks when and how co-mediation is appropriate. Can you maybe speak to trends you see in mediation and co-mediation and give some advice for students and new mediators alike as we try to break into this field? Surely, wonderful question and I wish everybody well. Um, Co-mediation is used more frequently in my experience and, and what I'm familiar with. Co-mediation is used most frequently in the family setting um, where combining a person trained in uh, mental health and someone trained in the law um, constitute a team that can uh, thoughtfully be empathetic to and understanding of multiple dimensions of uh, various family configurations now going through a separation uh, experience. My own experience, in, you know, such as the project of the Divide Community Project uh, at Moritz, where persons intervention intervene in, um, you know, public controversy, controversies uh, involving members of the public uh, stemming from uh, allegations of police misconduct, po police shootings, uh, defacing houses of worship, um, you know, um, endangering the lives of uh, uh, persons of immigrant status. Um, you know, those kinds of interventions in my experience, uh, as I tried to suggest in the response to Grand Lum's initial question, many, many mediators are, I would never enter one of those uh, individually uh, if I had the, and, and would try to look for the resources to support uh, a team, a team intervention, a quote, co-mediation intervention. Uh, but for those who are uh, in the early stages of their career, hoping to break in, there are some jurisdictions that actually require, if you go through their mediator, training program to become a member of the court roster of approved mediators, uh, that as part of the required training, that a already uh, operating mediator who has been appointed to that panel, take on a mediator in training and co-mediate uh, a case with that person. Uh, so that's, that's a nice way both to have a, an ability and opportunity to learn with and from an experienced mediator uh, in terms of how she operates and depending on who that person is to sort of share in the, in the responsibilities. Um, otherwise, gaining entry as a mediator needs to be appropriately, um, one's expectations need to be appropriate. It's wonderful to hear of a former federal court judge, uh, a former U.S. attorney who was invited by the parties uh, in the state of Michigan to mediate the Me Too litigation involving um, the allegations of sexual abuse. Nobody's going to choose a recently uh, admitted member of the Ohio Bar who was a Moritz graduate and took the mediation training program from Professor Kohler Froelich. Nobody's, those people are not going to hire uh, a person for that. There are other ways, though, for persons to enter the field, and uh, if one has an interest, and we can speak about it at a different time. But volunteering for programs, you know, like the Better Business Bureau, volunteering as a mediator, volunteering for uh, court and next uh, programs, working for provider organizations, uh, and if one wants to do mediation work full time, you know, it might not be, you know, the, the big civil litigation mediation that law professors write about, but the neighborhood justice center programs that uh, from my vantage point would hire 
would and should hire Moritz graduates to direct and lead those programs, including serving as a mediator, you know, within days of your graduate. I mean, you're prepared to do that. So points of entry into the profession um, vary, uh, but it's, it's important to be realistic about what kinds of opportunities and demand for your services uh, you know, might come and what, what kinds of cases uh, people might seek you out for and when in your career those would come. Thank you. So we are winding down on time, but we have two questions. If you wouldn't mind giving a quick response, I'll read both off to you. Um, and that will conclude the Q&A. And Professor Cole, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. So our, our first question comes from Ohio State mediator Aaron Roberts, who asks, what standards or principles do you believe courts should consider when deciding whether to overturn arbitrated or mediated settlement agreements? Specifically, what standards or principles should a court consider when determining if agreements are unconscionable or violate the rule of law? And then our second question comes from Bob Ackerman, who writes, might your apparent disagreement with Barack Bush be reconciled through a definition of self-determination that takes into account differences in resources, et cetera, that affects the process? Might we distinguish between fairness with respect to the substantive outcome and fairness with respect to the underlying process? Those are great questions, obviously, thoughtfully challenging to my presentation. I'm not sure, you know, let me, the, in terms of identifying standards, you know, I do think that there are thoughtful, you know, there's not one text that uh, one can turn to that crystallize the standards that ought to govern um, a, ju a judicial review of matters regarding uh, fairness, you know, conscionability, conscionability, unconscionability, uh, those requirements. You know, I do believe our constitution is relevant, both state and, and federal. It starts from there, but there are clearly more concretely articulated conceptions of broad public policies that ensure fair treatment among persons. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I think those are the kinds of resources I would encourage judges to to review. And I, you know, I, I think we're talking about a small number of cases that would actually warrant um, overturning. Um, there may be categories of cases where you know the the pressure to uh, to settle might warrant some kind of articulated policy governing mediator conduct and po potential outcomes there. But I think those are the directions. It's a great question uh, and I don't wanna dodge it, but uh, I think it, uh, it, it requires to some extent more concrete particulars uh, and, then, and then a response. In terms of my friend Bob Ackerman's question, um, I don't wanna go in, into detail if, uh, I'm not sure I heard a question, but, uh, the, the answer is, as I understand Boric Bush's preference for and commitment to uh, self-determination, um, I don't think it's, I think it overrides, it, it can be a, a, a value that uh, overrides considerations of fair treatment, for example, uh, that, I, that I don't think is persuasive. That's, that's the best I can do on that. Sarah, let me throw it back to you. Thank you, Josh. And let me ask everybody who's uh, here to join in clapping of hands, although I know it will be hard to see and certainly to hear, but I know that I could speak for myself and I'm sure for the audience to say how much we appreciated hearing from you today, Josh, and for all the work that you've done in this field over the last many years. And we look forward to many more good works as, as we go forward. So thank you again, Josh, and thank all of you for coming to the Schwartz Lecture this year. We'll look forward to seeing Josh's article in print in a future issue of the Ohio State Journal on dispute resolution. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>